Good morning. Our scripture this morning is from Mark chapter 6. The apostles then rendezvoused with Jesus and reported all they had done and taught. Jesus said, come off by yourselves. Let's take a break and get a little rest. For there was constant coming and going. They didn't even have time to eat. So they got in the boat and went off to a remote place by themselves. Someone saw them going, and the word got around. From the surrounding towns, people went on foot running and got there ahead of them. When Jesus arrived, he saw the huge crowd. At the sight of them, his heart broke. Like sheep with no shepherd they were, he went right to work teaching them. When the disciples thought this had gone on long enough, it was now quite late in the day, they interrupted. We are a long way out in the country, and it's very late. Pronounce a benediction and send these folk so that they can go and get some supper. And Jesus said, you do it. Fix supper for them. They replied, are you serious? You want us to go and spend a fortune on food for their supper? But he was quite serious. How many loaves of bread do you have? Take an inventory. That didn't take long. Five, they said, plus two fish. Jesus got them all to sit down in groups of 50 or 100. They looked like a patchwork quilt of wildflowers spread out on the green grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, lifted his face to heaven in prayer, blessed, broke, and gave the, the bread to the disciples. And the disciples, in turn, gave it to the people. He did the same with the fish. They all ate their fill. The disciples gathered 12 baskets of leftovers. More than 5,000 people were at the supper. As soon as the meal was finished, Jesus insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead across to Bethsaida while he dismissed the congregation. After sending them off, he climbed a mountain to pray. The word of God for the people of God. Yes, yes he is. Our story today is one of those stories where Jesus is doing Son of God stuff, and his disciples are like completely burnt out and kind of tired of it. <laughs> In a lot of the gospel stories, the writers are emphasizing just how many people were following Jesus. Masses and masses of people who are trying to get where they think he might be next. They're pulling at his clothes. They're begging him to save them. Hosanna, Lord, save us, heal us, touch us, forgive us. Just like in our world, there's so much pain and longing in Jesus' world. And the disciples are kind of trying to shield Jesus from it a lot of the time. They're doing like crowd control, you know, get these kids away from Jesus, don't bother Jesus, he's busy. And they're, Jesus is making it really hard for them. He's like waving them off. Uh, you know, let everyone come to me. He just has this endless compassion, endless love, and he can't help himself but to reach out, to heal, to feed, to teach, to save. In this story, though, 
Jesus is recognizing, maybe a little bit late, that his disciples do not have the same stamina that he has. And he's trying to get them some rest and relaxation because Mark says, so many people had been coming and going that they didn't have a chance to even eat. So they go in a boat to get to a remote place, kind of like a little spiritual retreat. The disciples are finally going to get some one-on-one time or some one-on-12 time with Jesus, hanging out and sharing food together like it was back before life got so busy. And I kind of imagine the disciples in this story as like a band of kids all packed up to go to the beach and they've got their like streaks of sunblock on their cheeks and their frisbees and their hacky sacks and they're like really just ready to, you know, kick back. But unfortunately for the disciples, the crowds are rushing ahead of them, getting ready to be exactly where they were going to have their one-on-twelve time with Jesus. And I feel like they're like giving each other kind of meaningful eye contact, like we're not singing Kumbaya with Jesus tonight. Here's what the message translation says. When Jesus arrived, he saw this huge crowd. At the sight of them, his heart broke. Like sheep with no shepherd they were. He went right to work teaching them. And he teaches them for hours and hours until finally the disciples, who are probably at this point a little bit lightheaded from the sun and lack of food and rest, say, Jesus, it's kind of time to wrap this up, right? Everyone's looking hungry, and we're pretty far away from the town. Maybe you should tell them to go buy their own food. And if we hurry and get back on the boat, maybe we can still make s'mores? (laughs) You've got to feel bad for these guys, right? They can't catch a break. And you all know the rest of the story pretty well. Uh, There are 5,000 people, not enough food. Jesus blesses the food, and everyone eats their fill, and there's a miracle of abundance. The disciples collect 12 baskets of leftovers. Scholars connect this miracle back to the miracle of manna in the wilderness, which was when God created the Sabbath for the Israelites. The Sabbath is a practice that declared that the truth about the world is not endless toil, but sacred rest. Not scarcity, but abundance. And not isolation, but community. So on this day, Jesus and the 12 exhausted, sunburnt disciples took their last bit of energy and their last bit of food and set a feast for the hungry. The lectionary cuts the story off there. The disciples collect the the food and it's a miracle. But the very next verse is this. As soon as the meal was finished, Jesus insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead across to Bethsaida while he dismissed the congregation. After sending them off, he climbed a mountain to pray. So here's the bit of good news that the lectionary leaves out. The disciples do get their rest without Jesus. He probably knew that if he went with them, the crowd would just follow. And I think we can only imagine how long Jesus spent with them, with the crowd maybe shaking hands and kissing cheeks and wiping tears away until he was finally alone going up to a mountain to pray. As I was preparing for this sermon, I started to wonder what Jesus said when he prayed. Was it always easy for Jesus to pray? Or, like me, does he sometimes struggle to find the words to say? Does it sometimes feel pointless? 
Does it sometimes feel forced? In seminary, there are many, many moments of silence. Theology professors, preachers, seminarians, and yes, even teaching fellows love to take a minute to pause and reflect and check in with your breath. And there was one day in my first semester of seminary that I had an 8 a.m. and a 9.15 and then community worship and so it was just about every hour that I was invited to check in with my breath. Derry was 11 months old. He was still waking up four or five times a night and I was like a bundle of raw nerves. I was trying to figure out how to be a student again, trying to figure out how to be a mom who was not with her kid 24 seven. And I was cherishing this opportunity to, to use my brain, but at the same time, I was in agony, missing him. So on the third time that I was invited to check in with my breath and take a moment to pause and reflect and sit in silence, um, I just about lost my mind. <laughs> I took out a notebook and I switched it out and I was just scribbling furiously that sometimes silence is not self-care and sometimes actually what you need to do is move and act and sometimes when you're sitting alone with your thoughts it just makes you feel worse. Um, and this isn't one of those sermons where I tell you that I realize I was wrong. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not knocking meditation, but at this moment, uh, like the disciples, I was totally burnt out by all of my responsibilities. And I was in a season of my life where I couldn't regulate my nervous system. I couldn't calm myself down by just sitting in silence and breathing. I needed more help than that. That semester, I had early classes basically every day. Um, so I was taking the 645 commuter rail into the city. And I got into the practice of sitting in BU's Marsh Chapel very early when usually no one else was there. And the lights in the chapel were off. So the sun was just kind of dimly illuminating the stained glass. And if you've never been to Marsh Chapel, there's this huge, magnificent kind of circle stained glass window right at the back of the altar. And it's just breathtaking, about 30 feet up. So, and it's Jesus, Jesus sitting resurrected, looking down. I was too exhausted to come up with my own words to pray. But after 30 years of Sunday school and Bible camp and church, there were words that I knew. God is my shepherd. I won't be wanting. I won't be wanting. He makes me lie in fields of green and quiet streams. Almost every morning of my first semester, I showed up to sing alone in the chapel. Amen. Sometimes just a line from a hymn Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. Sometimes a song that I learned in camp, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And sometimes I spoke more words, sometimes I wrote down some prayer, sometimes I did actually just sit in silence after that. But the showing up of it and the routine of it grounded me. I'd found the tool that I needed to connect with God. And it occurs to me now that Jesus 
also had words at the ready. Like us, Jesus had the Psalms that he could pray when he was too exhausted from teaching and climbing up a mountain. Maybe after he took pity on that crowd that seemed like a flock without a shepherd, he went up and prayed, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Maybe the disciples, even after witnessing yet another miracle, when they were at the very end of their rope, prayed together, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Our ministry together, all the good work in each of our churches, is sustained through the spiritual practice of worship through the spiritual practice of prayer, of song and communion and coffee hour and rest and joy. These practices feed us in the desert for God has set a feast for us. While I was writing this sermon, I started wondering what other people did to connect with God. So I asked basically everyone I was talking to, um, what they did, and I asked my Facebook friends what they did, and so here's a list, uh, non-comprehensive. Walking my dog in nature, music, gardening, meeting my neighbors, attending worship, praying scripture, showing up every week at a protest for a ceasefire in Palestine. Silliness, seeking out things to appreciate in others and then telling them and letting the joy spread. Acknowledging the flowers, slowing down and being quiet, committing to regular connection with friends, the act of creating itself. I noticed that people described spiritual practices that were both individual and communal, but that all of the practices involved connecting with either the life inside ourselves or the life inside of others or the life inside of the world. And this makes sense. It makes sense that we need the practice of going up a mountain to pray alone, but also going away with 11 of your closest friends to recharge so you can carry on the good work. Sometimes I need to sit alone in a chapel and sing and pray, but I also need to know that my voice is not the only one. When we show up to the contemplative practices group on Sunday mornings here before worship or to nourish, or when we share at the Bethel table, or give testimony, or take communion, we're sustaining this tender, loving community at the same time that we sustain our own tender hearts. And we can take practices from church home with us. We can take practices from home to church. These practices are not a life hack to be able to grind ourselves harder or make more money or get 5% happier. They're a tool that we can use to connect. Even though we might be physically alone while we walk in the woods, all of these practices invite the spirit of the living God to fall afresh on us. They affirm that we are more than our productivity, more than our skills, more than what we can provide. We are God's children, created in love and for love. We were never meant to do this life alone. So let's move into a time of prayer together as we sing the invitation to prayer. <laughs> 